Thank you, thank you. All right, all right. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming. I know it's a, you know Monday night. It's been a, a big, busy weekend and uh, with really fabulous weather. So I really appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, we think that we have a really great lineup for you, and we're really excited to present this Let's Games Begin uh, event. Um, and uh, in addition to thanking you all uh, and uh, and our panelists, I wanted to thank the San Francisco Giants. <laughs> Because they won it in four, we don't have to compete with them tonight. There would have been 10,000 people four blocks away taking all these parking places, so we're super happy that the Giants were able to sweep in, in the four games. So I wanted to thank them really quickly. And then just jump into what we're here to talk about tonight. And as I mentioned, we've got some fabulous panelists, so I'm really excited to introduce them. I'm going to turn it over really quickly, but I wanted to kind of uh, set an agenda of what we're talking about here and why we're talking about transmedia and storytelling. So when we define what transmedia is, we really put content and story at the center of the equation. So everything for us is building the story world around the technology. And if you caught any of the little animation that we had going before, we talk about Transmedia SF where storytelling meets technology. So for us, story is a, is a crucial element in what we're looking to create when we create a story world that we consider Transmedia. And so why is story really that important? It's actually essential to our brains. Neurologists now with functional MRI and PET scans have discovered that humans are uniquely wired for story. When we hear stories, it's actually as if we're experiencing it. That the, the areas of the brain that light up are the same areas that light up when you're experiencing an event. So stories actually, you know, uh, are, are just uniquely human in our world. They enhance recognition and cognition, they enhance meaning and empathy, uh, and it's really one of the most powerful forces that we as humans have created over the millennia. So when we look at story, you know, from a traditional narrative perspective, and I come from a film background, so this is from, you know, a, a well-known tome on story that there are eight essential characteristics of story, and Joseph Conrad breaks it down into, you know, there's, there's uh, order, chaos, and resolution, right? And that's your story arc, and all of the ways that we plant story as a traditional narrative. A lot of these um, are up for grabs when we're talking about an interactive environment, and particularly in games, right? Where, where the onus on the game developer is to create a fun and engaging interaction. So how do you create a narrative with its traditional form and how do you use this narrative in storytelling in a very dynamic and engaging and interactive format such as games? So it's a, it's a question that is going to be answered by our three uh, esteemed panelists tonight. And without further ado, I'm I'd like to introduce them and then we'll, uh, we'll get this panel started. Uh, so first we have Eric Lindstrom, who is a senior partner at Ludus Labs. Eric uh, has 30 titles to his name. He's been in the business for 25 years. He's made such well-known titles as Tomb Raiders and other, and other things that you will all have been familiar with. Uh, in addition to Eric, we have Jordan Blackman. Uh, Jordan has spent time at Ubisoft and at Zynga, uh, and he's just recently started up his own media company called Wander Media. Uh, in addition to uh, Jordan, we have Marty Kaplan. Uh, Marty is uh, at EA BioWare, has 18 titles to his name, uh, and spent some time designing games for the CIA, which is kind of interesting. So we're looking forward to hearing a little bit about Marty's spin on the whole storytelling thing. Uh, so uh, let's give them all a warm welcome. Thank you, everybody. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Lindstrom. Let's see if the microphone works. How's that? Is that my voice or the speaker voice? A little both. A little both? Yeah, there you go. That's better. Better. Yeah. Excellent. Definitely better. All right, well, uh, yes, I'm Eric Lindstrom at Lewis Labs. Um, what we do is we uh, bring about 60 years of experience in designing video games, both production and design, uh, to make uh, games from fun games to successful games. 
one of those pieces is this concept of uh, attachment and context and narrative. So that's what I talk about today. But um, given the short amount of time that Beth has us speaking, uh, I had a clear choice. I could either pick one topic and cover it adequately, or a lot of topics and cover it inadequately. So naturally, I'm picking the latter choice. And we're going to see how fast it comes up. Should video games have stories? So before you think it's that conversation, this is not the right question. This is the wrong question to ask. And it's important why that's the wrong question to ask, and that's what I want to talk about. But first, I'm going to answer it. Yes, of course they should. Everyone knows why stories are good. That's the introduction told us a lot of why stories are good on a neurological basis, not only psychological and emotional, but it adds all kinds of value, it adds all kinds of depth, it adds all kinds of lots of stuff. And no, they definitely should not be in video games because stories get in the way, they cause all kinds of problems with interactivity, hardcore games hate them, they are antithetical to each other. So the reason that this is the wrong question to ask is because the yes and the no answers don't share a definition of story. The yes people think it's one thing, and the answer is yes. The no people think it's something else, and the answer is no. So let's not spend too much time in academics. Let's just use some examples. This is a fun game without a story. It's just a jigsaw puzzle in real time that you can lose if you run out of time. There's no elements of story at all. There's barely even a picture to this jigsaw puzzle unless you think a multicolored random rectangle is a picture, which some people do, of course. But. So, uh, when did stories come into video games? Well, another wrong question to ask because of this definitional thing that I'm, I'm talking about. Mid 1970s, Lunar Lander, I love this game. It's got setting, it's got conflict, it's got a sequence of events, it's got a resolution. Depending on how you define it, you can even have characters. This has all the pieces that are the most fundamental building blocks of narrative. Space Invaders came later in the 70s. This is all a decade before Tetris. This has got a protagonist, the defender, and all the antagonists. It's got scope, it's an invasion. It's a story. And Donkey Kong, this is when you get it all. This is Joseph Campbell all over the place. You've got the nemesis, you've got your love interest, you're overcoming obstacles, and you're not just playing the game, you're out to defeat that guy. You're out to save her. You're out to overcome these things that he's throwing at you, and you get angry with him. This is all emotion. He runs off with her again. It's great stuff. <laughs> but some people that I tell this to say, okay, come on. <laughs> These aren't really stories. This is just rapid paper. Well, the first thing they say is, there's no dialogue. It can't be a story. They usually immediately realize that that's not a valid argument. There are plenty of stories in many different forms of media that don't rely on dialogue. It's the context that's the storytelling. The context is what's really important. That making Donkey Kong look like that instead of like that is only storytelling. That is exactly the same game. You're spraying, you're jumping over these green discs that are rolling down these planes, and that green square where all these little circles are rolling out of, that's just the generator, and gives you a safe spot to jump onto out of harm's way, which is exactly what the lady is doing. Giving you a place to jump up, constitute your safe end, where you're out of the line of fire of the gorilla, who is not even in this game. You don't need the gorilla. All of these pieces is just emotional pain, and people don't want to play this game. <laughs> <laughs> they want to play that game. And even the hardcore gamers that say that they don't like story, they want to play that game. 
because it has all these emotional attachments and meanings that work on a primal level, whether they want to admit it or not. But in their defense, when they complain about a story, they're not complaining about that. They're complaining about something else. But that wrong question, should video games have stories? Yes, they can almost not help have stories. You have to actually work very hard to make a game that does not have a story. Humans don't think that way. There are stories out there. I mean, there are games out there that do not have more than just trying to jumping over serpent. One of the popular games in iPhone is actually this impossible game where you're trying to jumping over squares. But for the most part, stories are an intrinsic part of video games. Except like I said, everything that they say, people that hate stories in video games, is true. Because of exactly what they're talking about. And they do not like the way storytelling is integrated into video games. But let's, let's talk about these specifically, because that's really the challenge of interactive stories. These are the most common complaints that you hear from the hardcore gamers. The dialogue and cutscenes are corny. Um, for context, the cutscenes are these sequences that you play the game for 10 minutes and then suddenly it all comes to a dead stop. You watch the little movie, gives you some plot, gives you a reward, on you go back to the regular game. Stupid and corny. Many of your plots are not compatible with open world environments. The player can go and do whatever they want. You can't tell them the story with story beats, the beginning and middle and end. And the cutscenes interrupt the gameplay. And the story version of game events contradicts my personal version of what's going on. And I wish I could talk about that some more. I wish I could talk about every one of these slides for half an hour each. But that one is the trickiest one. Because when you're talking about a scene where you're playing a game for an hour, and then you see a 30 second cutscene of the plot, and then you play for another half an hour, and then you watch a minute of cutscene. 95% of the experience is you and the game constructing your own narrative by taking the events and putting it together in a way that pleases you. And then suddenly, your character starts talking, and they're saying things that you weren't thinking, reasons that you didn't have for shooting so and so. And that disconnect is often what makes uh, even non-hardcore gamers want to skip these interstitial moves. So really these things break down into two categories. That there are storytelling techniques that transcend specific media type, venue, it's strong character, it's conflict, these things that are universal to story no matter where you are. Some of those things, all, all of those work in video games. Um, <coughs> but there are some things that are not universal that are specific. And they do work in video games. <coughs> bad dialogue is, is pretty specific. There's no excuse for bad dialogue no matter where you're. But there are some things that just do not work well in interactive experiences at all. And one of those is trying to take a film and a game and splice them together like shuffling it up the cards. So that's, that's the two categories. There's stuff that should work in video games and currently doesn't because it's being executed poorly. And the other is there are conflicts between narrative and interactivity that have not been solved. Which I don't feel that bad about, by the way. I mean, if you remember, Citizen Kane came, what, 40, 50 years after the film started? And all the great things that came out of that in terms of filmic language? I mean, the fact that movies were being made for 40 years before that stuff came around gives me hope, because these games have all been around for about 40 years. So let's go back to history a little bit and talk about how new venues, new media gave rise to new opportunities and new challenges. When it was just you know, the old guy sitting on the campfire telling you a story and it was all him, when that evolved into multiple storytellers taking specialized roles on a stage where we could actually have some representation of, of environment, new opportunities arose. We had 
actors that were specialized. We had sex to, sets to contextualize the action. But there was a new challenge that didn't exist before, and that was the audience was more distant from the storyteller. And some of the solutions were dramatic cosmetics so that faces couldn't read it at the cheap seats. The concept of, of having to project your voice so that everybody in the back could hear you even though you were whispering in terms of what the dramatic scene was requiring. And that was a talent that actors had to develop to project, but actually be conveying an intimate emotion. And then film came along, there were some years that passed with it, and some of the opportunities were closer to the, uh, the real world that people live in, not just sets, but actual filming on location, various effects, and especially film editing, the idea that you could take whatever image you want, splice it together to make your sequence however you want. But the challenge that came that was completely new was this concept of people getting disoriented by the juxtaposition of various types of camera cuts. And that, you know, that's a whole degree program. But here's an example. Just don't cross the line. The 180 degree rule, when you're doing two shots, so that people can look at the screen and they can track the action in such a way that they don't get disoriented, they understand what's going on in ways that really weren't even meaningful to people before the concept of film and film editing was invented. Video games came and gave us this new opportunity, this, this increased participation and involvement in what's going on with these characters, these events. It brought people in to the action in a more intimate way that we're still trying to figure out exactly what that means on the very psychological levels that people interact with narrative. And the challenge is that by giving all of these freedoms to the participants of this interaction, the audience, the players, you actually have a, a very reduced ability to craft the experience, to choreograph the sequence, to even determine the sequence. And the way to fix that, to turn that strength into, or weakness into a strength, is that's not me actually not finishing the slide. It's that we don't know yet. There's a lot of things that we have figured out. And that would be a great other night topic. And in fact, maybe the other speakers will fill in the gap because I'm trying to cover too much ground. Um, but this idea that people connect to what's on the screen differently when they are an active participant is a key piece. So I wanted to quickly go back to the list of the complaints that uh, the people that said no to storytelling in, in games were complaining about. And I'm not doing these in order of importance, I'm doing them in order of simplicity. If your dialogue and cutscenes are stupid and corny, that's because you're not hiring writers to write nice scenes. This is separate from the fact that you shouldn't have cutscenes in the first place. But if you've got dialogue in your game and it's crappy, that's not interactive's fault. That's not a clash of culture's fault. It's just, it's just uh, when video games started, the programmer did all the art, which was not a big deal when your art was a grid of 64 white dots, and you decided which ones to turn on and which ones to turn off. That was something that, you know, the Venn diagram of what an artist could do and what a programmer could do had a lot of overlap. Now they don't overlap at all. Storytelling and writing is just on that same track further down the line. Linearity. Uh, this is a common complaint. People talk about the, the non-linearity of player-driven experience and the linear nature of narrative. And I wish I could get into this some more, but it's simply not as incompatible as, as people often are afraid of. Uh, sometimes the answer is a lot more work. One of the first games I ever worked on back at Electronic Arts in the early 90s, um, I did a branching dialogue system for a real-time simulator. And in the end, I wrote about 40,000 words. Any given player probably read 10%. And 
that represents a huge production waste cost in current production thinking. But I did that at night and on weekends in about 10 days. And it wasn't fuel to material, but it was a lot better than the average crap you're reading in other games. And that put it a notch above, and it was noticed in the press. And it just came down to a simple methodology of delivering the content in a logical way that adhered to narrative construct rules and accepting the fact that you were not writing great and rare and novel. You were writing scenes. The math was putting the scenes together in correct ways and accepting the fact that any given person that you're connecting with is only going to consume a percentage of the content. Which is fine. Get over Point of view, this is that um, my personal version doesn't match the version presented to me. Um, another way to say that than what I previously spoke about was this idea that um, when you're playing Superman, my example, or if you're playing you know, Gordon Freeman, or any other non-character where the player is supposed to be imagining they're in this scene, they're the ones running around these corners, they're the ones pulling the trigger, they're the ones doing these things. And people that really like that don't enjoy as much being another character and letting them do all the talking. But just like there are movies that are successful that are comic book characters and some that are more, you know, everyday guy in an extraordinary circumstance, a lot of it does come down to personal preference. It's not just an interactive problem. And cutscenes. Um, I think I was going to talk more about this, but I'm just not going to. Cutscenes are just a bad idea. <laughs> and I've made a lot of them. Um, what it is, is a, a belief that a movie, because of its visual nature, is what narrative is. And when you're making a game, which is like a movie, it's on a screen, it's visual, it's, it's people and voices and all of these things. It's just too easy to fall into that attractor of make a movie and intercut it with interactive. And it's just, it's just the wrong approach. And it's great to see the industry have the movie away from that more and more. But it's got a long way to go. Oops. So, um, this diagram isn't about what's better. This is, about, this is about complexity. <coughs> As you go from novels to theater to film to video games, you get more capabilities, you get more opportunities, you get more tools, and you get more challenges. You get more problems that film has had 100 years to be solving, and they're still working on new ways to address a lot of these ways that people can attach to what's going on on the screen. And we're only just beginning, but there's plenty still left to do to figure out how human psychology reacts to what's going on on the screen. And here's a quick example. When you're watching a James Bond movie, are you just watching him? Are you sympathizing with his motives? Are you empathizing with his feelings? Are you actually pretending I'm him? Is that changing every time that the scene changes? With every cut? That is a pretty hard problem to think about in film. As soon as you let the player hold the controller and they're steering where you walk, where you shoot, whether you shoot, not to mention choosing what you may or may not say, that has huge implications on the way people feel about the interaction. That's why people are so upset when guys on the screen say the wrong thing. Because they are able to construct their own experience so much more by playing the game than people do by watching the movie. Which is still going on. There are plenty of movies that are very underplayed. And you have to figure out what you think those characters are feeling. And very often that is, how would I feel if I was that person in that situation? And how does it play out? It gets much more complicated with interacting. 
So this I took right from Wikipedia. I didn't even change how you spell theater. So a narrative is a constructive format. Okay, the game's already there, I didn't put it there. And it is the Latin verb to tell, but related to skill. And that is where I want to end. That's this idea that interactive brings so many challenges in terms of understanding the reaction of human psychology as it relates to participation and to apply that knowledge skillfully. And that's where the industry needs to continue to move. Not just understanding the new challenges, but to apply people that have the expertise to make choices that audience respond to positively. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, Eric. That was great. Uh, and I have to say, uh, Eric uh, and I spoke for a couple of hours, and the depth of his knowledge is just really amazing and mesmerizing. And he really could do uh, in, in depth courses on any one of these subjects. So after our other presenters, we'll be all up for a panel. So think about what, your, what questions that you want to ask Eric and our other presenters as we're going on now with the evening. And uh, we'll definitely be bringing Eric back for another presentation with us. Uh, up next is going to be Gordon, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan, Jordan Blackman. And Jordan, let's see if I can get this. There we go. Just to remind everybody, Jordan uh, has uh, experience with uh, Ubisoft where he worked on um, the CSI franchise. I think he's going to share a little bit about that. Uh, he was just recently at Zynga, so if anybody wants to ask questions about that hot potato. Uh, and he's uh, recently started his own company called Wander Media, and he's got some really exciting things that he's doing with that. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Jordan. Thanks, Beth. Um, Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so, I want to talk about uh, an experience I had when I was at Ubisoft working on the CSI brand, and, um, and why, why should you care about this? Well, I think as people studying transmedia, there's a lot of like amazingly, um, amazingly creative new uh, bottom-up ideas that are coming up, and it's, it's great to see that. Um, this is going to be a, a kind of a different story, a story that, that's more of a top-down perspective and it's sort of a, what it's like in the trenches with a, with a big brand, a, a pre-existing big brand, and trying to do some transmedia storytelling with it. So you'll, you'll I, I think, learn, uh, learn a little bit about my experience and, and hopefully some practical lessons that will, be, that will be useful for you. So I said CSI was big and probably most of you, you know that. To give you some numbers to tie to that, um, CSI's worldwide audience was estimated to be 73.8 million viewers in 2009. Uh, 2009 is the year that uh, we were building the products that I'll be talking about today. Um, as recently as this year, CSI was named the world's most watched television show for the fifth time. So uh, clearly a huge brand. Now it's also kind of a, a classically uh, cross-platform uh, brand. While there's not a lot of movies, there is an exhibit at uh, the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, a series of books that actually has 18 books, 18 novels, just for the Las Vegas uh, version of CSI, multiple comic book series, um, a Las Vegas attraction at the MGM Grand, board games, children's educational experiment, experiment kits where you can play with chemistry and, and forensics, uh, a, uh, a, a bi-monthly magazine that uh, that I think actually stopped uh, maybe a year or so ago, um, but that ran for five or six years. Um, and obviously the other television shows in addition to Las Vegas. Um, and what we're gonna be kind of focusing on today, which is the video game franchise, which had over 12 entries or, some, or something like that. So, big property. And, and I think it's, it's one that we should care about because uh, it's, it's a real world story of taking something like this into uh, 
into a bit more of a transmedia space. Uh, so, just a quick quick note about who I am. I'll go through this kind of quickly. Uh, I started off at Disney Interactive, where I worked on some, where I worked with brands um, and uh, was doing a lot of uh, a lot of website stuff. And, and actually, there's sort of some interesting things we did with Tron that were transmedia relevant, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Then I went to Nova Logic, uh, where we did a lot of military first-person shooter kind of traditional hardcore multiplayer online games, and I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, and I went to Ubisoft, where uh, I worked on a number of games uh, for all sorts of different demographics, actually. Uh, you're seeing here some tween girl titles, and, and one that was targeted uh, towards, towards um, older adults. Um, but I did want to make a quick mention about Jewelry Designer, because it's kind of an interesting transmedia thing, where in this DS game, you could create your own jewelry, you ran a shop. You create your own jewelry, custom design it, and we set it up so that you can go online, send your design in the mail to a jewelry manufacturer, and have your custom-made jewelry handmade and sent to you uh, in the mail. You could also buy other people's jewelry. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, and then I, I worked on these CSI titles for about five years. Um, these are just some of them. Uh, and I'm not... Am I talking about these? I'm not talking about any of these today. What I want to talk about are these. So these are the CSI uh, games that were released in uh, 2010. Now, you're seeing the top titles, which are just a multi-platform release. Uh, and then, this was a, a unique game, Unsolved. And then uh, we brought CSI to Facebook. Uh, and the reason I, I want to talk about these is, is you know, there's this, there was this long, uh, long tradition of doing these CSI games, but uh, I was actually getting ahead of myself when talking about my history. After CSI, I went to Zynga. I worked on Frontierville and Castleville. And these games, they actually call this department that makes these games Storyville because of the deep story that, that they try to convey through those games. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and now I'm, uh, I started a, a, an organization called Wanderplay. I'm spending next year traveling the world searching for stories at the intersection of culture, cultural traditions, and play. So not so much video games, but card games, board games. And I'm not talking about that today either. Um, I do also consult for uh, Adrian Crook and Associates, which is a social mobile uh, design consultancy. And I teach game design at the Bay Area Video Coalition, just up the street. So what I am going to talk about today, CSI. Uh, what we did and why. I, I want to uh, take you through some of the thought processes that went into some of the key decisions in, in this, uh, this series of games. So one of the things we did is platform specific branding. So if you look at like when we had released uh, games in the past, you see the exact same cover, the exact same title, and the exact same content on multiple platforms, right? Typical cross-platform way of doing things, but of course that's not transmedia storytelling, is it? Because if you do that, you're telling the same story on every platform. So here we, we have different branding. We have Unsolved, and you can't really see it, but it's Fatal Conspiracy back there. And you, know, you, you might think, well, why don't, why don't we always do that? Well, it's actually a challenge to, um, to... It's harder to market the games this way, because you only have... Uh, so much money to market each game, right? So when you have unique brands and unique stories, then you have to market them uniquely to the audience. You need the consumers to understand that they can buy both and there's two different sets of stories. And that's additional messaging that is actually kind of complicated to communicate and tricky. So a lot of times, uh, you know, the marketing department, they're gonna wanna have one single story. So figuring out how you're going to um, get the best of both worlds there is something that you should have a strategy for if you're planning to take a transmedia approach on different platforms. So like in, in this case, what we kind of compromised on was sort of splitting the baby where you see that there's a similarity to the visuals. So we could do that kind of advertising that we've all seen at the end where there's like a bumper with all the different platforms and they're showing the exact same thing. We could get away with that, but we also had this unique logo, unique title, and all the stuff in the back showed that this was a, a unique game. And, and I bring up this marketing side because if you don't do that, 
then it doesn't matter if you've told a unique story in the different games, right? Because people aren't going to understand that that's available to them. So it's really important to lay that groundwork. Um, another thing that we did that, uh, that was different but an important groundwork is in all these previous CSI games, the stories are disconnected episodes. So we do it like the TV show, right? You're going to get to play through different cases. But the problem is those cases are, are episodic. And they each have their own kind of beginning, middle, and end. They each have their own criminal. They go to jail at the end, usually. Um, so that creates a problem if you want to uh, tell a story across different platforms because these stories don't connect up. So what we did is um, for the first time we told a story, we told stories and designed the stories so that they, they came together in a coherent way. And this is just a quick trailer that shows you what that looks like for one of the titles. Sound? So we've laid this groundwork, we've got different branding strategies, we've got these stories that are integrated within the games themselves, and, and what I kind of want hope to communicate is that we needed those things set before we could do the transmedia part, before we could tell one story in one game that connected to the other story in the other game, right? So when we have that groundwork, we're able to do that, but that comes with its own set of problems because you want each experience to be, of course, uh, you know, interesting in and of itself, right? But yet provide enough compelling uh, properties so that you want to go to the next, uh, the next uh, platform. So this is how we did it in this case. Um, we had uh, we created this character called the Queen Bee, who is behind not quite all, because you need your red herring, but who's behind a lot of the cases uh, in Fatal Conspiracy and you sort of bring that all together. And at the end, she apparently dies in an explosion. You guys don't mind that I'm giving this away, right? <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, right. Uh, you can just, just squint if, if you don't want to know. Um, and then on, on the second platform, uh, it's, it's a story about what happens when this criminal mastermind is gone and, and kind of the repercussions that that causes in the city. Uh, but ultimately, it gives you the opportunity to track her down. Um, and we also uh, did something brand new, which is bringing CSI to, to Facebook, which you know, is, is definitely a, a talk unto itself. But I do want to uh, mention a few key points about that. And let me give you this. By the way, I'm in this, which is very awkward for me to show it to you. <laughs> My apologies. No? Maybe I need to do that. There we go. So we are bringing Go ahead and use that. We want there to be really compelling 
but very, very compressed stories. You come into work in the morning and you plan for 10 minutes and you get a little bit further in the story. You come back at lunchtime, you plan again. You do not come home to, to, to complete and finish the performance. In order to be in the office, uh, your boss walks by and you have to change uh, you know, <laughs> back to some pro productivity software. We've always looked to end up with something that's quick, accessible, but then can give you depth to keep you coming back. People want to solve crimes. They want to discover the secrets of the stories of people's lives, and that's something they can now do on Facebook. Okay. Oh, oh. I'm okay. I'm on. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about some of the key decisions that came up in this process. I think one of them that probably a lot of people who have played the game or who see the game are curious about is this look. So you see that it has this uh, kind of bobblehead look. Um, and, I, and I've been asked about that a lot. Anybody have any, any ideas on why we might have gone with this, this look? Curious. Curious to hear your thoughts. Yes? Show more character expression. So like it, because it's a sort of a um, caricature, you get to see the big, the big short, short. But I think okay, yes, that's that's not not um that's that was a factor because we know it's going to be on a small screen. It's going to be sort of a screen within a screen on Facebook for a lot of people. Uh huh. Anything else? Yeah. That is always very tricky. But you know, we do it on every platform um, in, in many different styles. We have a sort of a realistic cartoon style on the DS. We have a, I wouldn't call it a photorealistic style, but a, a much more representational style on console. Um, so each of those has its own challenges in terms of getting the, the approval of the stars and their agents. So yes and, and also kind of no. It could be similar with other Facebook What? It could be similar with other Facebook Why? Why are other Facebook games have this look? Yes? I think that's part of it. That goes that goes to the cartoonish the cartoonish piece. You know, it's not so much that we want to market to a younger audience, but I, I think a factor is we know that it's gonna be a 13 and up, we can't really control that. Definitely a factor. Um, the key reason uh, is that we know that the Facebook play pattern is more of a regular play pattern where people are going to be coming to this while they're at the office, and while they're at home, while something's cooking. And because of that, you, want, you don't want to depress them every day, right? That's not going to get them to re-engage over and over and over again with like this, you know, grotesque crimes and, and you know, criminals who really have this deep brooding, brooding look. Another reason is that because of that play pattern, the stories have more of a a caricatured nature, right? We have to sort of, you know, have these little popcorns of activity that happen in the story, and you have to be able to just eat ten little nuggets of this story. And it's awkward to tell a story like that and com and combine it with grotesque images and and seriously deranged characters. So, so you, you know, there is a whole uh, group of reasons, um, and those are, I think, two two kind of key ones that are worth worth sharing. Um, so, one of the things we did that was uh, really exciting for us is we got to have a month where each episode that played on TV was paired with an episode that we premiered in the Facebook game. Uh, the way that we made this happen is because we do work with the writers from the show to write the stories uh, on Facebook, and they were so excited about the Facebook game that they actually lobbied to make, to make this happen. Uh, and it was, it was obviously for us, it's a dream come true to be able to have a connection directly with what's happening on television uh, in real time. And, and for the audience, it's a great way for them to experience the story on a more profound level. Um, and I think this is a really great example of how we were able to have some transmedia elements in this big pre-existing brand. Uh, we also created a club that you could get membership to uh, by entering a code into the game and this club gave you extra benefits in the Facebook game. This was really important for a couple reasons. Um, one of which I'm going to get to in a slide or two. But it, it really allowed us to uh, take advantage of all the cross-marketing opportunities. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. 
So here, this is part of the photo I just took this last night. But every copy of the game on Xbox and PS3 included a code. You could enter that code in Facebook and you would unlock a year-long membership to Facebook Club Elite. So two things that are kind of interesting. One, Nintendo doesn't allow it, so we didn't have it on Wii, we didn't have it on DS. Um, and uh, the other thing that's interesting is this is actually not the right way to do this. Um, we're driving people from console to Facebook. We're driving people from a platform with a small number of people that costs a lot of money to a platform with a huge audience that, that they can play for free. What we want to do is go the other direction, right? We want to drive people from Facebook to console. Why didn't we do it? Because uh, we didn't have the production capability to create new content for people on console just if they had played the Facebook game. So, uh, you know, one of those examples of how some of these strategies play out in, in the real world when you're dealing with uh, a property like this. Uh, cross promotion. So, one of the great, great aspects, you know, there are certainly some constraints that I've talked about, but you have a lot of opportunities as well with a brand like this. So, you know, I talked about the code. We were able to pack in codes in CSI DVDs, in books. We were able to pack in the DVD ads into uh, the, the console game. So, you know, it, this sounds just like marketing, but it's more than that because if you don't, if you're not directing uh, your audience across the different transmedia properties you have, you cannot tell your story. You need to have the audience actually moving around. So if they don't know about, uh, about the DVDs, if they don't know about your social game or your mobile game, uh, then they are not going to get that 360 story that you are here to learn how to tell. Uh, talk about the codes, TV bumpers. We were able to cross promote with CBS.com. So when you're creating, uh, when you're creating, you know, pieces of your storytelling experience, make sure to create places where you can direct people around, so that not only for your own storytelling, but also to build partnerships. Okay, so this this sort of just shows everything I just talked about uh, in one slide. So you can see how there's the, that's supposed to represent the TV show. We have the show's writer, the writers, the actors' voices, the music. We tied stories between Facebook and TV. Uh, we tied stories between DS and and console and PC. Uh, we unlocked some bonus content. Etc. So you can see that we succeeded in some ways, but didn't succeed in all ways. There's no connection between, there's no story connection between Facebook and console, or between uh, handheld. And, and now it would be mobile, of course, but, but you know, we had places where we succeeded and places where, where we didn't. Uh, and some of the results, I'm actually going to go through this kind of quickly, but basically, uh, <coughs> We were able to do everything you saw on the previous slide uh, in much less than a year. Production team of, of three people and with many partners. And I'm going to show you a slide that, that shows that uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, were recognized as one of the top Facebook games of the year. Uh, and we were the first Ubisoft game to break a million MAU. We later broke two million MAU. Um, and even today, it's been it's been about two years, but the Facebook game has about half a million people playing uh, every month, and, and I'm very proud of that. So, just some, some last thoughts. Uh, I, I left in the quotes. I took out the quotes in my other version, but that's actually not a quote. It's just something I remember. Uh, but, but it's really important because, you know, we all know relationships matter when, you know, as you go up uh, that complexity uh, diagram that we saw in the last talk, right? There's more people at each level. There's more relationships involved at each level. And if you were to see above the video game level, it would be transmedia, right? So relationships matter so much in this, in this business. Every single partner here, except for the who, I believe, <laughs> every single partner here, we had worked with, I had worked with, on a previous project. Um, and I, I don't know if we would have been able to do this had we not had that um, that previous experience. So, you know, the people that you work with um, internally and externally make a huge difference to your ability to execute on your transmedia vision. 
And the next slide, I think, is the internal slide. So I actually just, I, I didn't, this is just off the top of my head. Um, this is probably not comprehensive, but this shows uh, some of the different internal groups that we work with, in addition to all the external groups that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, and what's interesting when you're doing something transmedia, if you're doing something social at a lot of traditional media companies, whether it's a game company or a movie studio or a television company, probably even if it's a web company, all the different horizontal groups that you work with, their success is not determined by your transmedia initiative. So you better have great relationships with those people uh, because you are, again, those things are going to be what make or break your vision for what you're trying to do. We should have been on mobile. I think this is, you know, uh, obvious. There was a licensing issue that, that uh, we weren't able to do something on mobile, but something that was a failure on my part is we never reached out to the people who do have the mobile licenses to see if we could make something happen. And uh, that's something that, that when I think back on this, I know we should have been doing. Uh, so even if, even if you know, you're not able to reach a certain platform, think about what partners uh, you, can, you can connect up with, right? This is, this is about telling stories on a different platform. This is about connection. This is about interactivity. It's not just for the audience. It's also for your process of what you do. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I'm sure you all have a number of questions for Jordan. I, I, one of the things I really love about this is it really is a transmedia approach to this. And, and the medium is the message, right? You take the same content and on Facebook you can't have the photorealism because the content has to come in those popcorn-sized bites. Uh, so looking forward to talking a little bit more with Jordan. Uh, right now we'll be introducing our next speaker, Marty Kaplan. Marty has, uh, is now currently at uh, EA BioWare and has 18 titles. Am I getting that right, Marty? Something like that. Something like that. He's been doing this for a while. Uh, 18 titles under his belt. And, uh, and I'll just take it away. How do you take it away? Cheers. Thanks. You guys are All right, cool. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, like I said, uh, I'm going to talk about um, after the awesome game that you all made comes out what you want out of your players, which is the conversation around the water cooler, the mythical water cooler conversation that is, uh, is an effective and probably the most effective word of mouth way to make your game successful. And, my, and personally, I love it when players talk about my games. So um, the water cooler is all about the games and the stories that players tell about them. Uh, so I'm Martin Hunter Kaplan. I'm a producer at BioWare Redwood Shores. I'm working in mobile now, and um, all opinions here are mine. <laughs> uh, they make me say that. Uh, and uh, so what is the thesis here? So I'm thinking that uh, the best stories in games are actually the ones that players tell each other about the games they're playing. And uh, so I'm just going to go through uh, some charts and uh, like tell some stories about games that I've been playing. And uh, maybe we can get some people to tell some back to me, and, and uh, I think we'll all uh, uh, verify whether or not this thesis is workable. Um, so, first, a super exciting chart: the likelihood of emergent conversation. Uh, so, uh, on one axis, we have at the top linear storytelling, linear game. This is this is a, this is a big halo around this concept. It's not specific, but um, and on the other end, self-directed. So that would be. There's no railroading, there's no story, there's no cutscenes, or there shouldn't be any cutscenes, right? But anyway, totally open. Um, and then on the other axis, I'm going to talk about how you can have a very fixed game where what you see is what you get, you're playing it, there's really not much uh, in the game that changes over time for the player. And then on the way to the other end, it's custom, so you can customize your character, you can customize the world, you can customize everything that you're doing uh, to, uh, to basically as part of the game. Uh, so we're going to start with lots of games on here, and I've drawn uh, a few games from the top grossing, which is kind of the big target for mobile nowadays, uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll go through those and see if there's stories to tell about them amongst ourselves. Slotomania. I got nothing. I got, I got no stories for this one. It's up, it's up there. It's a successful game. It's making hell of money, right? But 
Um, yeah, not, not a lot of stories. I won, and then I mm -hmm. tap it some more out again. So, <laughs> we'll move there. No one, anyone here with an awesome Slotomania story? So, next, The Simpsons tapped out. So, it was an EA game. You know, I'm shilling for it a little bit, but the uh, uh, the upshot is it's number one grossing. Um, it wasn't, <laughs> uh, but it's one of those games that seems to be uh, pretty pretty successful now, and uh, it has a very linear sort of uh, gameplay to it. And um, uh, however, the stuff that you can sort of put together is pretty fixed because it is based on the license. Obviously, they have big. You know, Matt Groening will come to your house and shoot you if you don't do what he wants. So. Uh, uh, you know, that's, it's a, that's the kind of game that is. Uh, plot of Ellen, Clash of Clans. This is another big game on mobile right now. Um, I would put this uh, down towards self-directed because you can, uh, uh, in lots of mechanical ways in the game, choose your strategies to sort of attack all of these different um, reverse uh, 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 the villages you attack and that kind of thing, and then choose the order that you build your uh, uh, stuff up in. And if you're doing a lot of PvP, uh, so, how you defend and how you attack your buddies is a pretty important factor. Uh, next, XCOM. So this one's not mobile, but I had to put it in because, oh my god, XCOM. Uh, so this one's really, really great. We have uh, a lot of uh, uh, stories amongst all my friends about it, and so it's, it's a very core game, but basically it's about alien invasion, and it's selling really, really well in, on uh, Steam and is on, on console as well. Uh, and now finally Minecraft, so everyone knows a Minecraft story. Uh, in XCOM you sort of uh, have a, a linear storyline, but you have lots more customizability compared to say The Simpsons, because you're using a, a squad. And then in Minecraft, of course, everything is totally customizable. You have no limits, or it's, as if it's a block, you can move it, you can use it, you can put it anywhere you want, and it's almost a platform uh, for, for gameplay. Um, and then finally I'm gonna throw, you know, a nice curveball at y'all and say, Call of Cthulhu. This is, uh, you know, tabletop gaming. You are exactly, you know, this is the, where I come from. You know, when I was nine, to, at seven years old, starting to play this kind of stuff, really got me into games, and I'm a lifer now. And so anyway, Call of Cthulhu is a horror role-playing game based on H.P. Lovecraft's um, world. Um, very, very, any of his horror novels from the 20s. Anyway, it's great because you will die and go insane. Maybe in that order or reversed. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so that brings out just a kind of gameplay that is, is very compelling to me as a storyteller. Uh, so we'll talk a little about each of these. So, um, like I said, Slot of Mania, I got nothing. Uh, so Simpsons Tapped Out started, uh, you know, pretty good. They kind of fell over and then got back up. And then what really launched them was uh, the Treehouse of Horror. So this caused the storytelling amongst players to go like, oh my god, I remember how awesome all this Treehouse Episodes were before The Simpsons became totally like you know uh, your your granddad who's senile and you know still walking around, but it's not so funny anymore. But anyway, this stuff was really really great, and they could talk about it and they could reminisce stories amongst players, driving a game to success. <clears throat> Find a clash of clans. So this the stories here are all about like oh my god, my buddy attacked me, he wiped out my village. I'm going to kick his ass by popping 10 bucks on this game right now and destroying him utterly. And that's happened over and over and over to the point where it is like number two or number three top grossing, right? So uh, <clears throat> that's the kind of story you really like to hear, right? Like as a, as a, as a developer, you like, I balanced it well enough so that I'm motivating people in a free game to put down money to beat their friends' asses. So there you go. <clears throat> XCOM, so this one has so many stories that are so great. So you can customize your little like squaddies or fighting the alien menace. And everyone I know takes a theme or friends or family members and puts them in there and then plays an Iron Man mode, which means you cannot resurrect them. You can't take your save game and come back. When they die, they die. And they die a lot. So uh, you know, my favorite one here is, you know, I can tell you, is, you know, of course I put my wife in there. and. Um, I quietly resurrect her and recustomize her every time her, uh, she falls to, you know, the plasma weapons of the alien horrors. Uh, and uh, so, lots more stories about that. Really, really, uh, you know, just just told. And you know, it's the kind of stories that when you hear it, and this is important, you want to go get that game and experience that story for yourself. Um, you want to you want to play with your friends. You want to come back at your friend with a story of the same kind of thing that he just did, and really make uh, a conversation happen that goes over and over and over about that game. 
Uh, so let's see, a few more. So Minecraft is, to me, really interesting because people can collaborate to tell stories. It's a platform. You're making the Starship Enterprise, or you're going to make a world with your friends together. Or pe I mean, people are using it in all different kinds of ways to tell stories visually to each other, and um, also just like, hey, look at this cool thing I discovered. Here's the pseudo-random number seed, so now you can see it and experience that this world that I've discovered. Uh, you know, so it's all about the sharing discovery, sharing discovery. There's not a lot of narrative to it. People put their own narrative on it because that's what they're experiencing and they want to share it with their friends. Um, and then finally, the Delta Green story I got to tell uh, is, uh, so you know, this is not on computers, it's around a table, uh, it was a convention. Playing with an uh, amazing uh, keeper, as they call him, the sort of dungeon master. Of, and this is Delta Green, so it's modern. So what we, the, the characters we were playing were a CIA group that was running a black site in Poland in 2012. Uh, I was Yachtsman, who was sort of a, a corporate asshole who had uh, sort of gotten refuge in the uh, uh, in the CIA and just a, just a you know amoral dick basically. So uh, then. He counted out these things like this. So uh, you maybe can't see it, but basically it's the, the draft OMS guidelines on medical and psychological support for detainee interrogations, September 4, 2003. This is a real document from the CIA. <laughs> Interrogation support, what you can do, what you can't do. And then he gave us a menu. And we had like a bunch of detainees in the storytelling thing where we <laughs> decided how we were going to torture them. It was awful. It was terrible. I felt horrible, but I was compelled to play this character through the end, because that's just what you do when you play, you know, at a convention. And of course, as the night wore on, we uh, got, it got later and later, we had a 2 a.m., and we're like, oh god, we have to torture another guy. And, uh, <laughs> and in the end, in the end, the, the horror, like the, the supernatural horror that showed up was a relief. It really was. It was like, oh, finally the fiction. <laughs> is here and it saved us from like this horrible like realization of like what's happening in the real world. So this is conflation of um, real world uh, research and, and interesting stuff, the, the interplay between all the people who are playing different characters, their attitudes and how they dealt with the situation. And then of course the, the fiction that sort of came in on it. Just an amazing game that it convinced me again, and I've kind of always known this, that the best my, my favorite game experience is still with other people, still telling stories around the table, maybe with a system framework, maybe not. I don't know if anyone played Fiasco, but that's a new, new game with a very limited system. It's super fun. It's, it's improvisation for gamers, really. Um, so that kind of thing uh, is sort of at the way out of the, you can go anywhere, you can do anything because you're dealing with creating a world of human, with human brains collaborating. Um, and I can tell stories like that and make you guys laugh. So. Okay. So let's go back to our chart and uh, just, go, just the, go back to the thesis. So emergent conversation, like I think you guys probably enjoyed the story about the, the black site torture group <laughs> most out of this, although we had some fun along the way. So you know, I would say <clears throat> that the water cooler is most likely as you continue uh, all the way across here from the blue to the red, uh, where you can have linear stories and people will talk about them. You have know, self-directed stories and people can talk about them. But the more customization that you put into your game, the more uh, engagement that players can have with um, making decisions, that's, that's going to help you with your article conversations. So how do you make games to maximize chances of player-to-player -player stories? You create a world poss possibility. You support a diversity of experience. You provide meaningful choices. Now, meaningful is the most important thing there. So what games have up on pretty much any other media right now, and really it's, it's, it's about that meaning uh, in a world that gives you something to share about. So I did this, you did that, we we're in the same game, but we had this different experience. It's, uh, or it could be mechanical, it could be like my strategy, here's your strategy, I beat, you know, beat you with it, or I beat this other guy with it, or even just the story. Like, you remember when this happened? Oh, cool. And, but then I, I took on this boss this way, and I took the boss on this way. You have all different kinds of ways that players uh, engage with the game and have a meaningful choice that they can share. And so extra credit, of course, especially in our sort of you know, social games, that kind of stuff, you can uh, provide ways inside the game to show off or verify stories to friends where, um, and I think this is, a, this is a future direction that we're gonna see a lot. Um, it happens a lot in PvP, but you can see it in a lot of different um, games, even, even as far back as, uh, you know, third-person shooters where you have the videos that they share online, and, 
And of course, hey, uh, Halo and all those games have like amazing back-end systems to take videos of what you do and share them, do all your statistical analysis. Um, you know, that stuff is very mature right now, and uh, on mobile, it's sort of moving out of the hardcore <coughs> into people telling stories with the games that they play. Uh, cool. So, how, oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so in, in the end, uh, you know, this is really just a teeny, teeny, teeny little, uh, I'm going to make it. Sorry, guys. Well, maybe we can just look at it. Um, so, of course, there's, uh, there's lots more to game games than this little slice. Uh, but, you know, by giving people a an experience that compelled to retell, um, you know, you've basically expanded the mind share of your game in the best possible way, which is player, 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 telling stories to each other. Thanks. Um, I, I would like to do one little plug. If you, uh, uh, my team is looking for uh, engineers for servers and for clients who are familiar with Unity. So talk to me if you are one of those kind of people. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Marty. Thank you again. So, in case everybody didn't get that, EA, Bioware is looking for engineers and, Marty, what did you say? Engineers and? Uh, uh, engine, uh, soft, uh, server engineers. Server engineers. And client engineers who are experienced with Unity. And client engineers experienced with Unity. All right, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting perspective on this and really kind of talks to what I was talking about earlier about the power of story in the human brain that it comes back to experience, that we actually experience stories uh, in the same way that we experience reality, and we retell those stories in the water cooler. And it's in the retelling that we're actually reconfirming the validity of the story, enhancing meaning, increasing meaning and empathy, and all of those things that we look at and actually can now measure uh, neurologically. Um, I'd, I'd like to actually invite all of my presenters back up. Uh, we're gonna have a little opportunity for some Q&A. And, uh, and I hope that uh, some of you have some questions and then we'll uh, hear from our community and, uh, and then get back to a little bit of networking. So thanks guys, thanks for all joining me back. Is everybody, is everybody on? I'll set it up. Okay. Did you switch on? All right, who's on first? I'll ask that person a question. Does <laughs> everybody get five? No. Uh, let's see. Okay, Eric's up. Eric's up first. So, so Eric, when we met, we talked a lot about uh, narrative storytelling versus context. And I know that in a game like Tomb Raider, you wrote a lot of backstory. That never and cutscenes. And cutscenes <laughs> that you should never do. Um, that never saw the light of day. And so. Talk a little bit about the importance of, of context and, and that backstory that never sees the light of day. Well, actually, you, uh, you trapped me because uh, I've been doing this so long and the, the, the production constraints were so high that I actually minimized that a great deal on Tomb Raider. Um, I only made what we're going to put on the screen because of production pressure. Um, in terms of backstory, um, I know how easy it is to go down the garden path of generating content that never informs the screen, not only doesn't appear on the screen, um, but to make things consistent so that you get the characterizations and the, basically this is writing 101, which you don't see in video games, so I don't think I should explain it that much. Um, but uh, I was in charge of Lara Croft for a number of years and uh, because there was so much weight behind her in the community, uh, it took a lot of writing behind the scenes to frame what her character was, both in terms of what we thought she was internally and what the community thought. I actually worked with Tony Gard, who uh, invented Bob Gard. And one of the first things that he and I agreed on is that Lara was a psychopath. And that, that was something that was generally not believed by a large portion of the audience. They actually believed she was a hero. Uh, and she was not, she was an anti hero. So I had to do a lot of rulemaking and documentation that later informed the writing and the plotting and the, the dialogue where I could, I could thread this needle of 
of letting people who knew that she was just, you know, an asshole who just killed anybody who was in front of her versus the people that thought she was, you know, out to save the world. And, and a lot of innocent animals as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was not as controversial as my dad. <laughs> Great. And in, in comparison to that, and, and I know because with Eric, you, you didn't work with the, with the film writers, did you? No, no. Back then, um, there was a lot more of a wall between uh, uh, gaming Hollywood and uh, the, the licensors were uh, pretty much in two different camps. They, uh, the movies back then, um, they pretty much threw it over the wall because they wanted to make things that were pretty incompatible with the vision of the game and they weren't interested in the cross connection and they also didn't like the characterization that was present in the video games mm. so they really wanted a star vehicle for you know who and that's where they went so so in comparison you know now uh, it, it is a couple of years <coughs> later and, and a little bit more control over the csi characters than anybody has over angelina jolie um, you were actually able to work with the writers in Hollywood and in the writers' room, and they were excited about this. I, I, I'm going to actually start with Jordan, but I'd like to put it out to the whole panel to ask what you think the changes are that Hollywood writers are now interested in writing for games. Well, I think I think the changes, you know, the experiences that I had on CSI are already uh, like a year and a half, two years old, and I think it's actually evolved since then even further. Um, you know, the the interactive the interactive field just keeps keeps growing. I mean, maybe the traditional blockbuster games aren't um, aren't the exploding field that they once were, but um, the opportunity online is bigger than ever, and there's fewer and fewer uh, uh, major Hollywood films being being made. So I definitely think uh, there's a, there, there has been and continues to be a, a lot of interest and a lot of writers who you know want to get in early and get their foot in the door and interactive because they know that there's a learning process, they know that they need to build a resume, um, and, and you know, as someone, you know, creating an interactive product, that, that creates opportunities for sure. Um, and, and just as, a, as an aside, uh, Tomb Raider is, is, is an amazing game, and, and I can't wait to tell my brother that, uh, that, that we met. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he's, Eric's he's giving out uh, autographs later. So, Marty, uh, Eric, do you think that there's been a change? Have you experienced changes yourself in, the, in with Hollywood? Well, the thing that I thought was interesting about what you were talking about was a lot of my complaints uh, have been that uh, Hollywood screenwriters do not generally understand interactive because of the high constraint that the three X structure and the 95 pages and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you're talking about episodic content, and that's a whole different ballgame. And a lot of the things that you need for interactive are more compatible with the kind of thing you see in TV writing because of the nature of crafting scenes that aren't quite so lockstep front to back because you, you don't have large arcs sometimes. You have to do the building time and it ends where it starts and where it starts and where it starts. And those types of writers, I think, can have a lot more of a head start in terms of how to write. Yeah, and I think another huge thing is just that the, um, the situation is kind of reversed in terms of the flow of IP. So you're going from, it used to be a big movie would happen and then there would be games to support it or comic books to support it or whatever. Now it's totally the other way around. I mean, you look at like you know, Robert Kirkman and, and uh, you know, Walking Dead or any, any, these games, it's like there's this amazing um, work happening in, in sort of geek culture or traditional geek culture, but then all of the most successful development studios now are all those nerds who've been playing, you know, Halo, or whatever, forever. And um, so it's like kind of happens in games, happens in comics, ha and then flows into, uh, uh, grows into an IP that suddenly, like, a big temple movie comes out for it. Uh, I mean, maybe Hellboy is a good example of a movie, you know, mediocre, but, uh, you know, uh, lots, of, lots of examples like that that I feel like great. Think of. <laughs> I, I loved it too. I love it too, especially with the Lovecrafting themes. But uh, the uh, uh, the upshot of I think is that um, you just see uh, you know sort of media over time rise and fall, right? So you have you know 
the, you know, theater is still vital and important, but it's more of an art form than a mass media thing, and you know that kind of keeps being leapfrogged up and up and up, uh, just kind of like your chart. Like the possibility space becomes bigger, people get more engaged for longer. Um, you know, it's a, a two-hour movie, and you can anticipate it at, uh, beforehand, and then tell stories like I was saying, you know, just like games, tell stories from each other, after seeing it after. But that is nothing compared to say. Uh, you know, a social or mobile game where you have a two-year uh, relationship with that game, where you're constantly release every week you're releasing new stuff, or, or especially if it's a multiplayer PvP-focused one like uh, Battle, uh, Battle Nations or something like that, where people are just constantly engaged and, uh, and moving forward with it. So, uh, how that flows up in the movies, I think, is going to be very interesting. There's, there's also, there, in my experience, there's a difference between. Uh, film writers and, and TV writers, and um, you know, for the projects that I've done, the, my, my experience with is that TV writers tend to be a better fit, partly because of the episodic uh, nature, partly because of the time constraint nature. You know, TV writers, uh, you know, understand that there's that there's a deadline and that you are going to have this regular release of content. So, you know, after the game comes the downloadable content from the online game for next week's episode. Um, so there's there's that that resonance there, and I think uh, film writers some, sometimes get maybe too far down that path that you mentioned of creating a backstory because there is there is no deadline. Your script is is depending on the situation done you know when when you're ready, um, and and so that that doesn't really work for um, for a lot of game productions. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a couple of really great points that, that were brought up here. I'm gonna, uh, I've got three that I'm gonna come back to. Uh, two Marty really brought up, and I'd like to actually kind of explore a little bit with our audience. We're seeing a lot, and you brought up Hellboy, which I love Hellboy. Ron Perlman rocks in Hellboy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just thought he was great. Um, and the comics and the whole thing, I love the Hellboy uh, enterprise. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of movement across the media, both up and down. And Tomb Raider's actually a good example of that, too. Um, and you know where things are going from the comic now. Uh, Angry Birds has a, a, a film that's being commissioned in Hollywood, which is really kind of crazy. Uh, so, so what do you think about this kind of cross-platform pollination? Uh, it's it's a bit of franchising. It's a bit of transmedia. Um, where do you think the trend is going? You know, who wants to jump? Just between different different media. Well, I, you know, one of the things that I think that we're seeing is that things are starting out as games and going into Hollywood. I know that Hollywood producers actually like this because it vets itself, it garners an audience, um, so it's, it's, it decreases the risk for them as financial investors, um, you know, and so it kind of makes a little bit of sense there. What do you think about it as the quality of the game and the gameplay and the stories that are being told? Well, I think that quality will out. I mean, that's the thing. You look at, you look at a lot of comics, uh, you know, it came out in the era that uh, Mike Mignola's Hell Hellboy did, and like, there's just something about that series, like something about, uh, you know, um, amazing scene instruction, or, I mean, the incredible storytelling that's rooted in folklore, and yet this character is very new, it's a more modern, uh, you know, fish out of water kind of tale. Really, really interesting that um, it was compelling enough to convince, like, the more nerdy producers <coughs> to, to, to check it out. Um, so, <coughs> I don't know, overall, like, what's, what's the future? I think, it, I think really the difference is that um, overall the, 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 pe the money people are willing to back something uh, that they probably would never have touched in 30 years ago. You know, I mean, so, uh, depending on where it's come from or where, where uh, it doesn't really matter anymore, it's really about like, how interesting is the idea, how interesting is the character, how compelling is the story. And uh, that can be told in a lot of different places, a lot of different ways, and then sort of bleed into other media. I actually kind of sympathize with some of those uh, execs, especially the ones that got their job for reasons that had nothing to do with them actually having talent <laughs> yeah. or, or knowing what's a good story Taste. and what's a good movie. Exactly. <laughs> um, but we've been talking for years about <clears throat> let's not take a movie and make a game out of it. Let's come up with an idea, an IP, and that will be defined from the start, compatible and Compatible with movie, compatible with comic book, because so often when you make something great in one arena, you're living within that box and you're trying to do the best within those constraints. You take the larger constraints, but again, we've been talking about this for 20 years. People that actually sign the checks, they know it makes a good movie, and they're going to sign that movie. They're going to lose their job if that movie doesn't return. 
and the same with the combo code. So coming up with executives, the check signers, who actually have either the skill to recognize narrative that transcends their particular media and goes trans, versus someone who actually has the courage to accept other people's opinions and sign on something that they personally don't know is going to hit. That's a, that's a hard goal, but I know that's, that's the most goal. The, you know, the problem these days is, is noise. We all are living in a world where there's you know, all these tweets to read, all this ridiculous stream of ridiculous news to look at, um, you know, more marketing than ever, more film, more TV, Netflix, streaming, Hulu, watch it, take a snippet, watch the whole thing, watch the whole season. It's like this endless noise. So how do you penetrate that noise? That's, that's the problem. And there's not just one strategy. There's going to be different ways to do it. One strategy might be, well, I'm an expert in this field and I'm going to create the best damn comic ever. And, you know, hopefully that I don't give myself some opportunity to go trans, transmedia afterwards. Another strategy might be, you know, I'm going to create something that provides a unique cross-platform experience. Uh, another strategy might be I'm going to, you know, do a little bit of everything and see what, what sticks. And, and I, don't, I don't know that there's one strategy that's right for everyone. I think it's, it's situational. We did ask about the future. So mm -hmm. I know the future is, future is, uh, uh, plastics. Plastics. <laughs> plastics. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's, Kickstarter. <laughs> it's Kickstarter. Like if you look at the Goon movie, look at the, um, uh, 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 let's see, not the Infinity Engine, of course, the Eternity Engine game from, uh, from Obsidian. You look at like the Shadowrun engine from so many projects that I'm like, day one, I'm flopping $100 on that because I want to live. And so that's the fan power, that's disintermediating, like what media gets created from, I guess, all of those suits. All right, so, and I mean, you know, uh, right down the street here, right, um, uh, Project Red got funded, like, what, three times what they, what uh, they asked for? What the, uh, well, it's just like, an yeah, incredible, like, uh, the Cinderella stories keep happening uh, with the fans participating in funding, uh, and that's definitely new. That's 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 newer than new. So if there is a, if there's anything that's the that's from the future, it's that. Yeah. So anybody else want to predict the future? <laughs> Not against that. No. <laughs> so so it's an interesting case. I mean, in the game space, level seven, and of course, you know, uh, the the Wii, the new game box raised um, $8 million and Level 7 raised millions of dollars for their latest game. Uh, one of the questions that I have actually going back to that, and then I'm going to circle back around to something else that was said earlier, was, um, you know, is, is this, you know, where rock stars are being made because it's early days? In the same way that when iOS just first came out, when iTunes first came available, that it was really easy for Doodle Jump, two guys from the Czech Republic, to make millions of dollars, and Geared was a guy that, you know, quit his day job as a construction worker when Geared hit a million. And now there's 600,000 apps, in, I'm sorry, 600,000 games, there's more apps than that in iTunes. Um, you know, do you think that the, the crowdfunding is actually going to change in that way, where it requires huge marketing and, and background in marketing and, uh, and, and PR? I think it already has. Um, I mean, I, this isn't something I have a, a huge amount of expertise in, but I've seen most of the game Kickstarters that I see be successful come from you know, stars already. You, know? and you have to get that star power. You gotta get the star power. So really, you need the star power to get traditional funding too. Um, so I'm not sure how much that changes that changes it. I don't know, what do you guys think? That's definitely true for the, um, the crowdsourcing stuff. Um, in terms of the discovery problem, I mean, predicting that is, is difficult because the nature of discovery and the noise in the system changes every six months, dramatically changes every six months. And usually the reason that it changed is not because the world evolved or people became more informed or their tastes changed. It was because somebody somewhere changed a rule and they changed it arbitrarily or for some like algorithm. <laughs> yeah, they changed the algorithm, they changed the, what you can and can't do. And that, that's especially true if you're developing games for Facebook. Okay. <laughs> you can wake up the next day and, oh, hey, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've got one more question, and I'd like to open it up. So you know, coming back to the story of that story and, and, you know, the film writers and even what's happening in the water cooler, 
It seems to me that this is all a bit of fodder for creating a story world. You know, and, and putting it out there because if discoverability is so difficult and expensive, and virality is so desirable, and and even in the money people in Hollywood, franchising is that's the go the, the golden egg, right? You know, if I can create, where's the next my next Harry Potter? Um, so, how do you see these backstories being able to be utilized in transmit in the transmedia? Well, one thing I always loved about the tabletop role-playing games is that the books are not books of, with stories in them. They're books about a framework that have potential for an infinite story. You can tell a romance, you can tell a tragedy, you can tell a comedy, you can tell whatever you want. And so, you know, one of the you know visions from the uh, you know the cyberpunk era or whatever is like you know the, the metaverse where there's just all these different worlds where people all create them themselves. And, you know, it's interesting. That's that that has kind of you know, virtual, virtual reality, even uh, Second Life, or what I love is you know not caught on in a huge mass market way. So, <clears throat> Minecraft's probably the best example of that kind of platform, like tools given to players to create uh, a world themselves and then tell them the stories that they like in it. But it's certainly not mass market like say Slime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess that's a big yeah. The, the, the user-generated content here you know, is something that's been really, really hot. So it's an in interesting that you touched on that. Well, what I what I think about is, is integrity. I mean, you know, the same the same reason we're drawn to people that that seem to you know, no matter what context you put them in, there's that essential part of them that you can recognize. That's that's appealing, and you know they're like sort of really there. And I think it's the same thing with your with your world. If you're, if you're if there's no backstory there, then you, know, you bring it to all these different places. But what is it that you're really bringing? You're bringing a name. You're bringing, you know, an actor. Like there has to be the more the more of that that's there, the, the more real it's going to feel to people. And and, uh, and so I think you know the more the more different platforms you're going for, the more important it is to have that. As usual, I, I want to chop the question into 17 questions. So basically, the uh, question you're asking. It depends on, on where you're looking. The idea of engaging with Harry Potter because it's aspirational, because I identify with his story and his struggles and the way he overcomes them with courage and integrity, that is one situation. And then there's the, I want to hang out at Hogwarts, and I want to go to classics, and I want to run down the halls, and I want to cast spells. Be there. Yeah, it's, and that's the place where you make your own stories. And then aspirational with Harry Potter is when you live vicariously someone else's drama. And both of those are really important ways for people to engage in media. And they have overlap, but they're very different in a lot of ways. And a lot of what it takes to, to connect with the audience is to understand what they want, what you're able to deliver, and then provide the right tools skillfully for that, that bridge to, to be made. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not mutually exclusive. Like, I think that the, you know, Harry Potter is a seed of the experience in the world of Harry Potter. That is an example that people can then either, you know, just watch literally or go, okay, I'm going to tweak it like this and have my own experience. Mm -hmm. Great. I, you know, I know I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to open it up to the audience. I see hands already, so we'll start right here. Uh, since we're talking about transmedia, um, can you give a sense of magnitude of each media? Uh, uh, that uh, I guess your game has, your games have been, uh, you know, uh, I guess, mixed with, mm -hmm. and also what strategies have you used um, in your games or from from these other media to get one idea of you know a water cooler story to spread to another or to have to build that relationship. Uh, in terms of magnitude, I, you know, I've worked on billion dollar theme parks that never saw the light of day based on The Wizard of Oz. So like one of the like classic people. In terms of, oh, for, uh, team size? No, no, it's like uh, consumers. Consumers. Yeah, reach, huh? Well, uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's like you look at sales or whatever, I mean, the magnitude can go from, uh, you know, with free to play or free to play freemium games, you know, you get a big, Boost, especially on Facebook, you can reach hundreds of thousands, hopefully millions of people. Um, 
and uh, and then you know in terms of getting them to talk about things like the, the water cooler factor, you know it really is built into that K factor if you're familiar with that term, like the virality uh, and how you encourage it in the game system without pissing the players off so much that they rage quit. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you want numbers, that's, that's you. Yeah. You slide right, down. yeah. So, so um, you know, CSI Facebook, <coughs> I mentioned 2 million MAU. So, I don't know the total reach, but you could, you know, probably guess. The CSI, I mean, the, the Zynga games, humongous reach. Uh, you know, Frontierville alone, total uh, audience is at least 70 million. Um, but if you talk about customers, not all those people actually spend any money, right? So, that's a different number that I can't share. Um, but, but in terms of reach, that's that's certainly the biggest. That's where that's where Jordan uh, gets redacted. Mm -hmm. It happens to it's a small yeah. 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 Um, well, so no, it's a small percentage. Yes. It's a small percentage. percentage. It's ARPU versus ARPU. Um, so, so one of the things that we say though is uh, that not every product is uh, needs to be transmedia. And and Eric was saying this earlier, you know, kind of referring to a psychographic profile uh, to give the audiences what they want. And so from, from a transmedia perspective, we really look at uh, what is the appropriate reach for that audience, right? And if you're going after a female audience, uh, you, you would probably go towards Facebook. If you're going after a youth audience, you'd go mobile, um, you know, and then other audiences actually kind of dictate and, and move, move to other platforms. There are actually numbers, some numbers out there for that, and I'd be happy to share the research with you afterwards. I know we've got another question back here, so. Hi, uh, my name is Heather, I'm a game designer, and um, I'm wondering about the the water cooler aspect with these social games that don't have meaningful choices, but they still manage to have that virality, and I'm wondering if there's anything about the platform that lends it to that water cooler moments without those meaningful choices? Yeah, I mean, the water cooler moments in social games are, you know, sharing your leveling or sharing your... Uh, you know, you just finished this quest, or uh, you know, something like that. I mean, it's very, it's almost like, I mean, very simple one-dimensional. Like, you could probably put a dimensional analysis on the water cooler stories uh, if you want to dig in. You know, that's just like, I did this, and it goes on your wall, and people see it sometimes, sometimes they don't. And, um, and then you add the second dimension where, I did this, and I need your help. And so they grab, you know, get, you know, get your doohickey from them, or whatever it is. Uh, and then, you know, what I like really is the third dimension where they're not playing the game at all. They're in their real lives, and then they tell each other stories about what happened. And um, that, ha that actually happened with Farmville, and so here's a story about a story. Uh, I knew Farmville was going to be huge when not only my wife, who does not play games, played it, uh, and then her sister played it, and then their mom played it, and then they started to have, uh, they started to have, um, like farm optimization conversations <laughs> on the phone, on like chat line phone and on the, you know Skype. I could not believe it because like these were people who did not play games ever, and yet they were talking about who you got to build this first, you build that the other. Blah, 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 blah. So then I knew it's going to be huge. So maybe that's an example of what the the, the range, uh, maybe what you can do in social games might be. Can I, can I, can I speak to that a little bit? You know, you, I, I think that. Uh, Meaningful choices depend on the person, and um, there are, you know, he mentioned some optimization that players can do uh, in these games, and, and that's that's real optimization. You can, you know, there are people who are using Excel sheets to play uh, to play some of these games. There's also a huge, uh, uh, you know, we call it nesting, but like decoration, right? So the choices that people are making and how they're going to decorate their farm, uh, even even if it doesn't have a gameplay impact, uh, you know, it's. To call it, to say whether it's meaningful or not, is is, is sort of an uh, after-the-fact judgment. That is something that people definitely take a lot of, um, put a lot of effort into. I mean, some of the some of the uh, farms that you see are just unbelievable. The amount of time that that's uh, that's gone into that. And I think it's greatly enhanced by players to uh, share that. That's the thing. Absolutely. When you share pictures of it. That that is a second-dimensional motivation to do it, other than just personal satisfaction with yeah. decoration. And, and the games. Basically, you know, funnel you into each other's, uh, you know, homes so that you can see what, what the other people have done. So you know that people are going to come check out your. It's like it's like your your uh, you know it's like your living room. You know people are going to be in your living room. So 
you know, you take pride in, in the way it looks. I just want to say one more thing about this, which is there's another dimension to that water cooler thing, which is how much effort it takes to generate the story. So those Minecraft stories are, you know, incredibly rich. You know, you can create a Game Boy and a Game Boy game in Minecraft, and that's wonderful, and it's going to make the news. But the number of people who are going to do it is extremely small. So, you know, those, those opportunities that are, are less deep and maybe less interesting stories uh, have the benefit of being just easy to create. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that has its own, you know, uh, value in sort of the story economy. Great. We, we have time for two more. Ginny, and then here. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, Jenny, um, I'm primarily as a scriptwriter, and I'm, I'm primarily directing this to Jordan. What is the relationship between the story or the script that's happening in CSI and then the gameplay? So, how would that interact with, with you know, what would you write and what would you direct people to do that kind of the thing? The TV show versus and, and the game. You no, know, in the game. But what would you do? I mean, like it was an example where you said, uh, you know, search for something. I did in one of the little bubbles, and I just wondered how that how you would move the script along and then direct people. Well, I just want to understand. You're, you're asking how, within just one single game? Um, in, in a, in a, through a particular game. So you, through the game okay. play, you've got sure. this narrative that relates to the game. Sure. So, um, you know, there's ample use of the, uh, the cutscene in, in a number of these games, right? So, you know, you start off with some sort of mystery, and the player is engaged to solve the mystery, so they search an environment, uh, <coughs> and uh, there's, there's really a pattern of finding clues, taking it to a laboratory where you process the clues in different machines that have their own mini-games. Uh, that reveals new evidence which, uh, which, takes you, which unlocks more story and a new scene. That's the basic pattern. Um, and I would add that for CSI, you know, a big part of the show is, um, gosh, it's been, it's been a while, so I forget what they call it. But as they're collecting evidence, they'll hypothesize. Right? Oh, well, maybe this happened. And you'll see these little imaginations of what their thinking may have happened. So we include those as well, uh, where you might collect a key piece of evidence and, you know, Sarah Seidel says, maybe, you know, the, this caught on fire and that caused the, the, maybe there was an arson after all. And then when you go to the lab and you, and you do some sort of analysis, you discover, da, 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 it was arson, right? You know, it's a really interesting time in uh, broadcast world. The Wall Street Journal had an article a couple weeks ago that television viewership for the fall shows was down 15% in the 18 to 49 year old demographic. Now, we don't think those people aren't watching screens, they're just not watching TV. And so Jordan uh, made a comment uh, earlier about moving people from lower cost media to higher cost media, and I think that's the golden ring these days in, in, in media and, and in transmedia. Not all of these media. Thought on bridging the gap between the narrative and the gameplay and sort of do you imagine a game that is sort of like moving the game where emotions match up with your real emotions to a real person? Or if I'm a player and I play the game and it makes scenes between my real life and the virtual world of the game so that those two, those two things that you talked about being incongruent or more congruent, are people moving that direction or are people seeing that as a holy ground, it's impossible to touch? Because of programming challenges? Wow. Um, well, imagine the world five years from now where Siri just doesn't know what words you're saying, but knows whether you're angry, or knows whether you're sad, or knows whether you're sarcastic. And you actually can talk to the game, and it parses what you're saying, but it also parses your meaning. I actually quit playing Mass Effect because I had choices to make. And one of the choices was I was told some important piece of information and I chose the response of, um, I'm not sure if I believe you. And I chose it. And my character pulled a gun out, put it in the guy's face and says, I'm not sure I can believe you. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to do. So I'll tell Casey about it. <laughs> and, um, but but you got I, a good story out of it. I could, uh, <laughs> second hand story, the big water cooler here. Um, so uh, that's that TBD I put on my slide. There's a lot of stuff out there that I think is unsolved, um, but I think that there are a lot of opportunities for those to be addressed through 
applying known storytelling and narrative techniques to the challenges that you understand about interactive, and then there's stuff out there that is two steps past that. And until we know, I mean, no cutscenes, right? I, I still use cutscenes because that's the that's the hammer I got in the toolbox. And until we can figure out the better hammer, that's what I'll fall back on when, when I have to, to, to find the lesser answer. When I can't make a game like Portal or like Left 4 Dead, where the stories scribbled all over the walls and you just pick it up as you go. And the, and the, the hardcore people that don't care about that, they don't even focus on that. They just see zombie dead. And then you talk about the water cooler, that's like, what was written on the wall? What, what, what was behind that? Let's go back and check it out. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the more that we can understand the range of player intents and to, and to respect them and to appreciate them, as opposed to the designer sitting at his desk and saying, I make games for myself and this is how I feel, that you can allow for the different player types, the different player motivations, and accommodate them as best you can, or create a situation where it's, it's not the question. Like I mentioned before, when you're playing for an hour and then you get a cutscene, and then you play for an hour and you get a cutscene, that's an environment for people to go off script if you have a script in mind. So you don't make that scenario. If that's the way your game works, you better not write a script that you expect people to be on. Yeah, I'd always, I always, I really can't wait till I can make a game that checks whether somebody's scared and then does something and then checks and then does something and then checks until they're out. Who's scared about the idea of Siri knowing that you're angry? <laughs> <laughs> that, that you sound. <laughs> now, you know, it, it, it's, it's an interesting point that you make in, in filmmaking. You know, we talk about parody versus pastiche, right? And Pixar does an excellent job of this with all of their children's animated features. Right, there is this underlying nuance that is really geared only towards the adults. And the three-year-old will laugh at it, but the adult will get it. And I'm seeing the same thing in what you're talking about, that they, there's a certain person who's going to read the wall, and there's a certain person who's not. And so it is parody versus pastiche in that environment. Uh, I mean, I definitely don't have an answer. I, uh, you know, to me, the different, the different things that are available to us in terms of, you know, I, I, love, I love Portal. But I also love Uncharted, and, and I, don't, I don't have a strong opinion about, you know, what is allowed or not allowed in, a, in an experience. And I think, you know, I think it's good that people have strong, strong opinions, and it creates good, strong content that, that you know, carries that person's a, a opinion. But ultimately, I think, you know, it's also good that different people have different ways of doing it, and, and I like that. I, I also think that, you know, in, in the transmedia world, we're going to have to open ourselves up to more ways of doing things. Um, and to uh, using any technique that's that's available. That said, you know, I think the problem is is the problem is noise. You know, like there's just so much there's so much uh, there's so much noise in the world right now. I think that people are craving uh, human, real human connection. And you know, if we can figure, you know, and that's why you have these social games. But then these social games are they actually? You know, facilitating that or not, and I think that's that's a worthwhile debate to have. But I think the people that can crack that problem and, and make people feel more connected, th those are the those are the properties that I think are going to explode in the next uh, ten years. Great. Can I answer that question? I, well, I think it's the wrong question. You're asking how do you address the disconnect between your avatar's emotions and your emotions, and I think you need to be asking yourself why do we have an avatar? And I think if you look at things like alternate reality games, which are a subset of transmedia, that avatar is going to go away. And I think that that's where things are going to go in that direction in 10 years. I think that that's true that that will happen in some segments. But there are people that want to go to a movie and they want to see Indiana Jones. And there are people that want to be Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And when either I'm put into a gaming environment that it's every man, it's just me, I'm not actually role playing somebody else, and I know I'm not going to shoot anybody. <laughs> I know I'm not gonna. So there's this vicarious gap between what people want to do in life and what they want to do in fantasy, and there are different ways for people to cross that bridge. And I absolutely love that idea of people being able to immerse and express their their inner demons directly. I'm convinced that that's not going to supersede 
the aspirational role-playing comic book hero stuff where people can say, you know, I don't want to think about me flying. I want to identify and live vicariously through that guy flying. In, in two days, it will be Halloween, and you will see people taking on their aspirational roles. And it's not come as yourself, right? You know, it's come as, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I, I just really want to thank this audience. There's, you know, I hope to invite them each back. I know that they could all do a keynote for us in the future. Uh, but let's give them a round of applause and thank them. <laughs> some more beer and wine and, and stuff. Um, but before we cut to that, uh, we have some um, announcements uh, and uh, some uh, community announcements from members of our community. Mike, did you want to talk about next month's event? Hi, everybody. So our next event is going to be actually on Tuesday, November 27th. We're going to give everybody an extra day to recover from Thanksgiving. And it's going to be all around the emerging role of the transmedia producer, and we're going to be hosting that at Western Eyes production with a host of really great women producers. This is going to be a whole women panel, which is our first time. And uh, we're very excited. We have one of, uh, one of our panelists here already. But the rest are going to be a, a secret, Susan Bell. Uh, but yes, yeah, so come join us. Uh, the event boards are going to go up tomorrow, so uh, we hope to see you all there. Uh, we are hopefully going to be recording all of it, but always we have a, a lean here that posts our uh, events every time a day after, so we are going to have that online in one form or other. Great. And we do try to post the events and, and the content of the events. Elise! Hello, I'm Elise from Joints Video SF as well. So, if, do you guys know what Startup Weekend is? So basically it's a hackathon, so people get together for a whole weekend and they build prototypes of startups or projects. Um, so usually people build startups, but we are launching Startup Weekend Transmedia. So basically a hackathon where we'll be building together transmedia stories and projects. So you're all welcome to come. Um, it's going to happen here at Berry Soma. Thanks, by the way, to, uh, uh, thank you to Berry Soma for welcoming us. It's going to happen here at Berry Soma, January 18th. Um, tickets are not on sale now, but stay tuned. And we're also going to start a bunch of classes on transmedia production and writing and everything here at Berry Soma too. So stay tuned, and we hope to see you all and build really cool stories at Startup Weekend. Thanks. Thank you. So those of you that didn't know, we actually have a successful transmedia jam this summer uh, that was 30 hours long. This is a longer version of that. We had incredible success, and I see some faces that were there with us. We had a rockin' weekend then, and we're looking to actually take it the next step and add monetization with uh, for transmedia. And one of our community members, and actually a member of my team at uh, Match Factor, uh, Kevin Smith. Hi, I just wanted to take the chance to introduce myself to the group. Uh, I'm Kevin Smith, I'm an independent game developer working on Lost Spells, The Tower of Alba. Uh, I've always enjoyed games, particularly board, card and board games. I've spent many hours working on playing the words, and Lost Spells is kind of my realization of that. I spent many years in the game industry working for companies like Namco, working on titles like the Vessel and Top World for Crowdstar. And finally, I decided I wanted to start to work on my own games. And I wanted to make games that I wanted to play. I wanted to make games that were casual and inviting, but treated the players respectfully and offered their minds a stimulating challenge. And Lost Spells is what I came up with. Lost Spells is an adventure game based on the shattered spell books in the Lost Tower of Alba. The players proceed through a series of Jigsaw uh, word puzzles and recreate the, the crosswords, earning gold, energy, and learning the spells that they need to help our heroes meet and back through a mysterious Celtic adventure. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm reaching out to people in this group. I'm looking for particularly anybody who has experience launching an independent game or who has experience with crowdsourcing. These are things that I'm looking to do with this game. Uh, I hope what I can contribute back is, uh, you know, I do have a lot of experience developing games, especially on the technical side. And I'll certainly share my stories with you as I go forward with this. And as I learn things, hopefully you can learn that with me. Thank you. We'll be launching an Indiegogo campaign. We'll let you all know about it. So we want to support and connect our community to each other. So I hope when you see Lost Spells launch on Indiegogo that uh, that you'll throw uh, some some uh, support that way. We've got some great perks, including some parties coming up for that. Our next announcement for our community is Stephen. Thank you. Hey there. Hey, uh, I'll be quick. I'm Stephen. Uh, I'm a tech guy. Uh, I used to work on uh, Delicious, the social bookmarking site, if any of you have heard of that, hopefully. Cool, some naughty heads, good old days. Um, I had a startup called Blockboard uh, that I founded that was acquired earlier this year. Uh, anyway, boring stuff. What's really interesting is that I have a real passion for games and for storytelling. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was really into theater. Um, I love film, TV. Um, games, your video games, I played my share of Call of Cthulhu, actually, uh, so role playing games, all that kind of stuff. So um, I feel that uh, not enough people are kind of equipped to tell stories, but everybody has stories in their head, and the means of production are not in the hands of the people, generally. Like, so most of us in this room actually can't make video games, right? We certainly can't make TV or film, um, although some of us can. Um, so anyway, I created something called Tell Together, uh, which is a web uh, tool that lets anyone create multiplayer storytelling games. So you don't have to be a programmer, you just have to know how to basically edit a wiki, and you have to have an idea for a story, obviously. Uh, what it lets you do is create reusable story worlds. So these are text documents that can be used to create interactive games that are multiplayer. So you could create, you could say I have an idea for a story setting, maybe it's science fiction, maybe it's romance, maybe it's mystery. But then you can create this and publish it, and then you and other people can create unlimited numbers of games from them and play them online. One player takes the role of the narrator, the other players take the roles of the characters in the story, and the system helps you coordinate telling the story over time as an ongoing narrative. So this is not launched yet, it's a thing I built. I'm looking for feedback is why I'm here. So I'd love it if you check it out. Uh, these links will let you look at the example game and then actually sign up. Let me know what you think, like positive or negative. I'm just curious what people think. Great. Stephen's looking for beta testers. Beta testers are really platform. So we're actually going to show you one of our jams. Uh, you know, one of the things we've changed the format a little bit. We're asking people to kind of submit to us uh, the announcements in advance. But Jenny's been a, lo a long time member of a community, so she's got something she wants to announce. Oh. Hi, um, uh, I'm doing a book on finding funds for your film. And I've written about 200 pages in single space so far. Um, I'm looking for two things. One is for people who want to tell their story about how they raise funds for a film, uh, particularly an independent film. And the second thing I'm looking for is people who might want to read the uh, preliminary manuscript to give me fee you know, feedback or be endorsers if you like it and uh, uh, you know, have your website and you know, other links included. It's being published by Hal Leonard and it's a follow-up book to my original book that I wrote with them called um, uh, The Complete Guide to Writing, Producing, and Directing a, a Low-Budget Short Film. So anybody who's interested, please, please contact me about it and I can send you a PDF of the manuscript. Thank you. So Ginny is looking for people to interview and people to edit and read and prove her book. So that, that's actually going to wrap us up for the night. And I want to thank everybody again for coming. Uh, our panelists and speakers are going to be here for a little while with us. Uh, look for us right after Thanksgiving when we're having the Producer's Guide to the Galaxy, Transmedia Producer's Guide to the Galaxy. I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks, everyone.